Yeah, I like this. Start on, I won't mess this up too much for Jim. But as Bob says, my name is Steve Young, and I'm fortunate enough to be the chief of the Cape Elizabeth Fire Rescue Department. Um, we want to thank the Historical Society for inviting us out tonight and talk a little bit about our wet team. Who's, they've got a lot of positive press lately for a few of the rescues they've been involved in. Um, currently, the, the water extrication team is a division of the Cape Elizabeth Fire Rescue Department. The team's made up of a captain, a lieutenant, and about 15 very active, dedicated members. So when Bob invited us out here for this evening, we talked to Jim and, and Dan and a few of the members got together and went through pitches and spent one whole evening putting together this slideshow. And I think they had a lot of fun doing it. So it was actually a good time. And we've had, I believe, three of the wet team members are original to the team. So as people are getting older and aging out, it's good to put some of this history together. So it was a good opportunity for us. So um, like I say, Jim put the PowerPoint uh, slideshow together. So he's gonna narrate through it. He's got the peanut gallery over here to keep him on track and, and online. So if you guys have any questions on anything you see, I think feel free to, well, Jim will format what he wants from you. So I'll turn it over to Jim Frazier, another longtime member of the wet team. Anyone know where this is? Post office, yeah. That was the pop question. So the South, South Portland Cottage Road uh, Post Office, this is a mural uh, painted in 1939 by Elzira Pierce. And it's the British, uh, represents the British steamer uh, Bohemian. So it had uh, 218 passengers, crew of 99, 42 people perished. Uh, there was some uh, misalignment between uh, uh, getting the pilot boat or signals out for this, and it was bad weather. There's usually bad weather. There's usually bad seas, and uh, uh, ships uh, like to hit rocks. So that's that's in a nutshell. Uh, you weren't on that call, were you? I was not on that call. That was uh, 1864. Uh, but this one ended up uh, between, uh, across from Broad Cove, Maxwell's Point, and uh, people, local people turned out, got the bonfires going, helped people. Uh, there were a lot of uh, Irish immigrants on this uh, boat. I don't know whether it was directly crossing or coming from another port, but uh, uh, a lot of history, certainly. Uh, shows a little bit of the despair there. Uh, uh, Peter, Peter Batchelor says there's about 300 or more shipwrecks, uh, groundings around Portland, probably 100 of these uh, in the Cape Elizabeth vicinity. Uh, and uh, we know a lot about them because people are fascinated. Uh, people record the uh, uh, events. Uh, the Annie McGuire uh, on the cover of uh, Plum's book here was uh, the one at Portland Head. And when you go to Portland Head, you go to the right and you look down on the rocks and it's Annie McGuire uh, memorialized there. They said there was a plaque there at one point and uh, I couldn't find it the other day. So plaques have a history too. Uh, this one, uh, the Annie McGuire was 1886. So this is just a teaser. Uh, if, if, by the way, if you came only to hear about the life-saving station, now is the time to get away. Uh, <laughs> I don't have to listen to me. Uh, but this is a 1892 uh, plate of the crew at the life saving station with the gear, the attack. One of the dories is out in the background, and uh, the the Newfoundland Hound, uh, still used around the world as a life saving dog, kind of in competition here with the uh, labs, but. Uh, uh, they were uh, famous for their uh, uh, ability to uh, uh, help out in rescues. Uh, let's see. 
So why is there a wet team? How did it come about? Um, 1988, uh, one of these fishing vessels came up on uh, Trundy Reef, the Judy and Betsy. And the uh, we don't actually have any pictures of that sheep but, uh, in this show, but the uh, everybody turned out. So as a as a town response, so the police, the fire department, uh, rescue would be rescuers. A lot of people with good intentions to help. So there were a lot of people on shore and on the point. Uh, Just from some of the descriptions, uh, about 125 feet out and different different uh, statements give you a different dif distance, but uh, uh, further enough away so people couldn't uh, uh, walk out to it on the point in the surf. A lot of the, the boat was uh, smashed up, at least on its side. Uh, a lot of the deck equipment, uh, a foul in the water fuel spill, and uh, the crew wasn't uh, in the survival suits that we uh, uh, know today, so uh, they're getting beat up, and uh, the, the volunteer effort to try to get out was to lash people on the ropes, and uh, three of them tried to walk out through the surf, and they pretty much got pummeled onto the rocks, and uh, came back. Uh, we know that Jody Jordan was the hero of the day, uh, took a skiff out, got around, picked up some, uh, a couple of the Coast Guard uh, divers who were out of way and couldn't get in close enough to the uh, ship, ferried them in. They extracted the crew, got them into the uh, skiff and uh, got them back to the uh, Coast Guard vessel. There's different versions of that too. So in, in one, he just nosed in and they jumped in. And so uh, depends on who's who's recording the uh, incident. Uh, but that's the that's the pivotal one. So a lot of discussion the next day uh, and and the. Uh, days to come. Uh, it was uh, clear that the town didn't have the uh, proper uh, equipment, know-how, techniques to uh, respond to that type of emergency. Uh, uh, we, we critique in incidents, right, Chief? We do have after action reviews, we like to call them. And they're pretty, they're pretty cordial most of the time. Uh, when you read this one, uh, it's a, a couple of degrees off from scathing uh, because they left no uh, no punches uh, withheld and uh, it hit in a lot of quarters. But every, everybody was uh, uh, of the same mind that something needed to be organized up. Uh, it took the form of a water extrication team. There were some other teams around the country. I know they reached out to uh, uh, some uh, lake areas in Arizona, uh, an underwater team in Florida, uh, and uh, got other expert advice. There was local advice as well from, from uh, people. And uh, I think in, in all that we've done as a team, uh, the local knowledge that comes from the fishermen, from the lobstermen, uh, from people that are uh, working on the water. Uh, it's really been the backbone of what we do. So it's not as simple as putting a boat there and putting somebody in it and say, go rescue. Uh, it would be my downfall to do that. So some of the things they came up with, uh, the lights from the shore were bright. They they were directed uh, so that the Coast Guard couldn't see what was going on, so they were kind of blinded. Uh, too many people trying to be helpful uh, and uh, some probably at risk of getting uh, washed in in places. Communications were in disarray. 
uh, lack of knowledge, lack of protective gear. And uh, within a month, uh, this was pretty well uh, conceptualized, getting down on paper, and they'd have an organizational uh, meeting. And once they get ready, they uh, put out a uh, uh, call for applicants to uh, join the team. They get about 40 people. They whittled that down to uh, 25 or so. And uh, there were 16 that uh, started the initial training. They had a lot of uh, local involvement for uh, trainers. They had a very detailed uh, path to go through. Uh, Don Richards uh, did some uh, pool training. Uh, Connie Rowe, who was at the uh, Coast Guard base, uh, stayed with this team for as long as he was at the base uh, before he left and uh, supported us with uh, training and uh, equipment. And uh, other people were involved. Uh, Alan White, Brian Tony uh, did a lot of the first aid training, CPR training. Uh, Paul Richards, uh, uh, Paul Rollins did uh, some of the uh, swimmer techniques and so forth. Uh, by uh, March of 90, the Coast Guard had a helicopter up here so that they were doing familiarization with the team, the ability to uh, uh, hoist people into the uh, chopper. And we had a lot of donations coming in. People were really uh, strongly invested in this. Uh, we know uh, Jody was bestowed a uh, Coast Guard Lifesaving Award and the town received a commendation. Uh, by the end of 89, we had about $9,500 uh, worth of equipment and uh, stuff that we uh, can't do without. The team was organized up into uh, different sections. So we had uh, boat handlers, people that could run the boats, we had uh, shore support, and uh, those were people getting the getting the boat ready to launch, getting people into gear, uh, doing communications, doing following the boat, uh, doing charting, and the in water rescue were the swimmers that are available. So you see some familiar names on there. And, uh, Um, I didn't expect to see that. Is that the same Kevin Kennedy again? I believe. I believe so. Okay. Oh, a different one? Diff different one? And I did mention too that two of those names, Andy Strout and uh, Dan Merriman, are still with our team. So we have original members that are still. That's right. Active. And they're and they are great storytellers. I wish I wish they were both here tonight. So. Um, so Jim, we have a question over here. What's a Mustang? What was on one of the earlier? Mustang is uh, one of those orange work suits. So it's an exposure suit. Uh, it will give you some buoyancy in the water. It won't keep the water out, but it will uh, keep you alive uh, for uh, a little bit. Uh, we got our first boat. Kind of, off, I think, offered for sale for us, but then uh, donated uh, from uh, Mr. Weidman. And we got our first uh, vehicle, which was uh, affectionately the bread truck uh, for some. Kind of a love-hate thing. Uh, it was a used vehicle, but it, but it was our first formal response uh, thing to uh, keep equipment in and... Uh, uh, respond with. Uh, all the time uh, we're talking about, go back there a second, these these grants that were awarded, uh, we'd uh, give credit to uh, Mike McGovern, uh, who was always in the background, uh, always a lot of support for this team uh, as it uh, uh, made its way along and uh, he put in applications for, for some of these grants, so uh, he did us right. Uh, had a few growing pains, uh, and 
as a new as a young organization, things were firming up and people got in, got got the concepts of how they were going to work with other town departments and uh, other agencies. Uh, uh, Chief Pickering had uh, herded the cats for a while, and he uh, passed that uh, uh, baton on. And uh, we organized up uh, as a bylaws uh, independent uh, organization. So we're under the police department uh, originally. And uh, as you know, the fire department today, all of those companies, the rescue service and the wet team, uh, engine companies all came in under the umbrella of the fire department eventually. And uh, we got a lot of uh, support from the chiefs there. As, as soon, almost as soon as uh, they got any equipment or they got any boat to use, uh, they had three more rescue calls come in, uh, uh, three more groundings, and uh, the Rebecca Ann was uh, off uh, Richmond. Uh, the small Zodiac boat was used for that call, and uh, they kind of realized uh, maybe we need something a little bigger than uh, the uh, little inflatable, uh, but... Uh, it uh, got these these calls got a lot of attention. Bill Caldwell uh, uh, wrote a piece, and uh, other people uh, heard about it. So the bread truck, uh, the uh, coined the wet van. We still call our truck the wet van today. Uh, our new one. Uh, familiar faces. This is a uh, a little later on uh, and uh, we'll talk about Joe Mokery, uh, who uh, Andy is leaning on there uh, a, little, a little bit or directly. But the truck uh, storage of gear uh, provided an area to dress out for some privacy for di uh, divers or swimmers to uh, dress out, uh, warming area for people coming in out of the cold and a uh, command post. We'll take a look at the command post. Just to talk about Joe for a minute. Uh, Joe uh, learned of the wet team through a uh, article in the National Fisherman and uh, inquired of us. Uh, he uh, he met with the team in uh, May of 1990, and uh, pretty much uh, moved, ended up moving down here and uh, bringing his business down. Uh, uh, it, it, it's kind of good karma. Uh, Joe's a specialist in uh, diving, uh, rescue swimming, uh, high angle rope uh, work, technical rope rescue. And uh, he's been our mentor over uh, many years uh, doing training. And uh, uh, we're, we're, we're lucky to be bringing in new people like uh, Eric and Haroon, who have uh, rope and uh, diving and swimming experience as well. But uh, Joe has uh, worked all over the world giving classes to uh, public safety agencies, industrial, uh, governmental uh, units, military, some of the maritime academies up this way. So he was uh, instrumental with us. Uh, the command post in the uh, old truck is on the left and the new truck is on the right. Uh, Danny, who was the guy that donated the carpentry uh, expertise to that, to build that for us. I think the, the basically the whole team chipped in. He did all the work on the inside. Okay. Yeah, there was one 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 name I was trying to think of that, yeah. that did the uh, console, but uh, yeah. A lot of teamwork. Uh, DPW did some work on the truck and uh, so forth. So 
and I know I'm bouncing back and forth in years here a little bit. Uh, uh, as we were organized up, we were asked by the Portland Fire Department to uh, be on the uh, jet port uh, response. So when there's an aircraft emergency, we're one of the water components to that. And we go to the South Portland uh, public landing. Uh, we're usually not called on small small planes, but over 15 passenger passengers or uh, souls on a plane, uh, we will go to the uh, response. And we also uh, were aligned with the uh, kind of the harbor disaster plan uh, involving a lot of agencies uh, with the Coast Guard. So our bread truck uh, would be replaced around uh, 2002 uh, with a just a bare bones uh, truck. And uh, as the captain said, we uh, put in a lot of labor ourselves, uh, got some material from the town and uh, fitted that truck out. It's packed to the gills with uh, equipment and uh, you can see we uh, carry the uh, our ten foot inflatable boat in the uh, van, so that uh, if we respond to, uh, say Fort Williams, we can go to the beach. We can launch from there, uh, and uh, have everything we need. Have the outboard uh, underneath for that. Uh, bags of rope for rope work, protective gear. Uh, there's a lot of suits there, and I can tell you that's a, a pretty hefty investment uh, that uh, we uh, truly appreciate from the town to uh, get people in the right kind of gear to get into the water, to be protected from the elements and uh, be able to perform these uh, rescues when we need to. Let's see. I'll let you read that one. With with great gear comes great responsibility to to uh, take care of them. I mentioned there was this article in the National Fisherman. This was a a, a three page uh, spread and. Uh, uh, talked about how the team was formed and so forth. And this actually produced uh, inquiries from other places and uh, about how we set it up and they'd like to do it and uh, uh, put us in contact with people and on other teams that uh, we got some information from. Uh, and as I say, uh, Mr. Mokri was uh, attracted through this. So uh, this was uh, also something was also in offshore. We couldn't find that one, uh, but uh, get the word out. So we knew the uh, the ten foot was a handy boat, but uh, we were trying to find something bigger. Uh, they spent a lot of time looking for a surplus uh, craft and uh, sometimes showroom demos, uh, that type of thing, and uh, that fell through. So eventually, through budgeting and donations, uh, we uh, went after a boat. And uh, let's see, there, there is a backstory there about, uh, they were trying to get this thing to us by uh, uh, Memorial Day. And it, it started in Anchorage, Alaska, where it was built, had to go to Tacoma to get on the uh, rail, got on the rail, got into New York State, and uh, despite all the uh, uh, labor strife and so forth, and then the, I guess it set off some kind of unstable load uh, detector, and they, they disengaged that car and put it on a siding. Didn't have anybody to unload it. Uh, but it all turned out and uh, got up here for uh, Memorial Day uh, services. So 
most of you uh, would have seen this uh, boat before, uh, 18 foot orange boat. And uh, this is as it came. Uh, there was a shelf added in the uh, back for the uh, ray dome and uh, some of the lights. But uh, basically an open boat. Uh, it would give you a different kind of ride depending on where you were sitting. And there was some shenanigans in that regard, I think. Uh, it's classified as a fast boat, a search and rescue boat. Uh, this one was de dedicated to uh, We're going to assist with a uh, um, medical emergency outside. Uh, this boat was uh, dedicated to uh, uh, Aaron Tinsman, one of the, the Tinsman's uh, sons. Team at uh, not too long uh, after getting the boat, so faces. Uh, Andy Strout, uh, Gary Weaver, Kevin Gilda. Uh, I can remember some of some of them. Uh, and yep. A woman in the top there. Yes. Is that the first woman? Every woman. Um. <laughs> I was hoping someone would pick up on that. <laughs> so we have, uh, the, there's no rule. Uh, and uh, we've had uh, uh, folks come on and off and somebody's smiling in the back. But, uh, our women uh, members have uh, typically been uh, uh, both good on technical rope rescue and they've been strong swimmers. So the more we can get, the merrier. Uh, We've had about 75 to 80 people, I think, uh, over the course of the wet team that have come on, done a stint, they've gone off the team, others have come on and uh, we've uh, maintained that original core of people uh, uh, who uh, kind of stick with it. So uh, we've got, everybody brings uh, different things to the team. And uh, we're, we're stronger for that. Yes, sir. Can you describe for us why this boat is uniquely suited to what you're doing? Uh, how do you go out and approach the boat? Do you put men in the water? Do you have men in wetsuits? How do you use the boat? Give us a little more mechanics. If you so the where these type of boats uh, fit in, is where the Coast Guard boats can't get in or, or by rule, they're not allowed to go in towards the rocks that closely. So uh, we can get in, we can maneuver around uh, uh, our coastal features or islands uh, uh, pretty close for search. So we get good visibility from the boat. Uh, it is rapid as far as a rapid response. So they'll uh, they'll uh, go pretty fast, and uh, there are features to these boats like the uh, the rope rings, rope grabs all around. So if you had a lot of people in the water, uh, they'd have something to grab onto. It's also how we uh, recover our swimmers. So uh, if the Marine Corps does it, they're doing it full blast and. Uh, guys hanging on and flipping in. We do it a little slower, but the uh, idea is the same. And we do have, uh, uh, when a boat goes out, it will have a uh, operator. Uh, it will usually have a second person to assist with the uh, radio and uh, 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 looking at uh, some of the displays. We'll talk about uh, one or two swimmers. Uh, that would that would be a, a full crew pretty much, and we could probably take on 
three Dan victims. Yeah. So uh, that that'd be about about it for the bulk. If it were catastrophic, well, we might get more people into it. But uh, that's that's the basic operation. So. How did you do in syrup? You can basically fill it up with water and it still floats. Uh, right. So it's got uh, the. Uh, just scop is on the back, so it it drains uh, as we're going along. If they if they choose to drop those uh, open, and uh, uh, I've never seen us bail it before, so no. we can bring that boat right into the rocks. If we got to get somebody off the rocks, we can bring that boat the way it's designed right up to the rocks. Yep. It wouldn't be much to get somebody off of it. And a lot of our operations are in in the bigger scheme of things for for disaster is to uh, pick up victims, transit to a larger boat, put them off for medical care or, or transportation to shore. Uh, in that that type Question, of thing. is there a searchlight on the boat that you can look, search for somebody in the dark? I don't. On a on a new boat, we have some some fixed lights around. Uh, we also have hand lights to go. And we also have an infrared camera. So we'll see a picture of that in uh, in a minute. Uh, this is the new boat on the left as it arrived and was uh, unpacked at uh, Port New York Services. And uh, it, it came to us from the Carolinas uh, pretty much Put together basically, but all the electronics and components were put in uh, locally, and uh, we got some training there. The red arrow is to the uh, the Fleur, uh, which we hadn't had before, but a lot of the rescue boats and uh, fire boats uh, do have. So this lets you see something like the middle photo, even if if the only thing visible in the water was the top of your head. If there was enough heat there, uh, that's enough to produce a, an image. Uh, and uh, we would immediately go to that spot and uh, see if there was a person there. Could be a harbor seal, or it could be the person we're looking for. Order. Okay, Alexander, uh, 1947, uh, we we stole this and used this as a wet ahead. We sent, kind of spread it out and that was, that's been the wet team wet ahead. Uh, this was a uh, uh, grounding on the high head. Uh, this was a collier. Uh, Calling coal. Um, I think this one. It's one of these that struck uh, struck rock and uh, kind of tore up part of the bow, and that's why the captain ran it into the nearest uh, shore point, uh, which or towards the nearest shore point. And that was done frequently in uh, in uh, elision with uh, rocks or ledge. Uh, they knew they were going to sink if they did nothing, so they steered and schemed uh, toward shore to for best survival. Uh, Lyle gun was a cannon used to launch these uh, lifelines across, and the breeches buoy. Uh, was what you uh, rigged to that line, and uh, you would be able to haul that pulley back and forth and uh, uh, take people off. So they took off 32 people, uh, the crew of 32. So, so there's a cannon on the boat? Shooting out the land or the other way around? It, it could be either. I think in this case it was on the land. So this was the life saving service, uh, the crew that came down and uh, shot this out and then 
the GIA would uh, go out with instructions and they would assemble the breaches. Board. Not much to it, but it had to be uh, rigged in. And usually you'd get wet somewhere along the way. Uh, for whatever reason, they have not trusted us with a cannon. I don't understand why. Uh, we do have, uh, our tool is a uh, compressed air uh, cylinder uh, and uh, cartridges that we can charge with air. And uh, the line pack, the, the rope or spring line is in this box. And this thing will shoot out like a shoulder fired uh, contraption. They're getting ready to load it there. This was the older unit. So we got our first one in 99, got this one in the uh, probably the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and uh, the last time we used this uh, during a drill, we shot it across the uh, Sperling River. And uh, uh, it was a good shot. And, uh, everything worked. But every everything we do tends to be perishable skills. Uh, we have to get out. We have to do the... Uh, people have to do the swimming. Uh, we have to do the boat operation. So uh, the drills, the training is, uh, has always been important, and there's no uh, no rust from that. Uh, calls we respond to uh, certainly any distress calls uh, either were were called through our dispatch center in Portland by the Coast Guard. Uh, the Coast Guard may reach out direct to people on the team or the chief sometimes or, or vice versa when we have information. Uh, we help some disabled boats. Uh, we're not a tow service and we don't take the place of them, but uh, it depends on what's going on. Uh, certainly reports of people in trouble. Uh, I like to quote Mario Batoni, who says, you love the ocean, the ocean doesn't love you back, right? If you've never heard that before. Uh, people go out with uh, good intention and uh, they, they face the weather or they face the wind or the uh, surf, uh, not like they expected. And uh, sometimes it's just fatigue. They can't get themselves back into shore. Uh, we've had multiple calls uh, in that regard for paddlers, a stand-up paddle, kayak, uh, even swimmers. Uh, vehicles into the water. Uh, we've had a couple. Uh, one was a certainly life and death event. We'll talk about that uh, towards the end. Uh, a lot of overdue calls. Uh, my son went out, he was kayaking. Uh, I expected him back, he's not back. A lot of times we get down to the parking lot to launch and that person is putting their boat back on top of the vehicle, getting ready to go home, uh, which is, uh, that's the one we want to go to. Uh, so uh, overdue uh, safety boat for search and rescue, uh, dive, escort operations, uh, reports of uh, flare sightings. Uh, every flare has to be taken seriously up to a point, uh, but we have a lot of loose cannons, people playing with flares or just uh, shooting them off. So it's uh, it it detracts from having people ready to respond to a real emergency. Uh, uh, occasional watercraft gets uh, beached up. Occasional pilot whale shows up. Uh, I mean, one and one of those uh, falls on the rocks. Uh, working, uh, working in tandem with the uh, fire department companies and rescue uh, and uh, assists. Uh, usually, something out on Richmond Island. We're going to either go uh, do it or we're going to uh, take somebody from another agency or a company uh, out uh, assisting the Marine Patrol or Coast Guard or Harbor Master. Uh, that's our fair. Uh, planned events, what do we do? Uh, we, we're 
act as a safety boat for uh, triathlons, uh, swim, swimming events, fundraisers. Uh, sometimes the boats are needed during training uh, courses for fast boat operators uh, or swimmers. So we uh, uh, do our part there. And it's usually some of us are taking the course and other people might begin supporting operating the boat and so forth. Um, tall ships, fireworks, open houses, you get the idea. What kind of skills do we develop? And there's a whole raft of them there. Not everybody specializes in everything. Some people uh, excellent in the water. They, they, they may not care for the rope or working in the truck. Uh, but uh, a lot of us, uh, I'd say a lot of the team presently gets cross-trained in uh, a lot of things. Just uh, trailering uh, the vehicle is important. Uh, trailering the boats and operating the vehicles. This is a uh, uh, town vehicle got lights and sirens on it. It's not something people do every day. So uh, we do train. Uh, we do occasionally test out uh, other than our normal uh, launch sites to see uh, how that goes and uh, can be good and bad. I think this is uh, Sprague uh, Logistics over the other side of the harbor. And uh, water rescue include the skills cover a lot of things uh we, they if we started with somebody fresh they'd start in the pool uh do some basics uh, they'd be trained in the surf and the rock environment when we get an opportunity to schedule one we uh, go to swift water so either in the spurring river or out to uh, Saco river uh, do training uh, and open water uh, for uh, search patterns and nighttime and things on the ice for people going through the ice. So speed through a few of these pitches and uh, this would be culmination of activities in the pool, packaging up the victim and uh, getting them uh, transferred to a uh, board that's always, uh, if there's risk of spinal injury, uh, that's what we're looking at mostly, maintaining an airway, getting the person uh, uh, packaged, and shenanigans in the pool too. Uh, training in the surf, you have to go to the surf to uh, uh, be able to do it right. Uh, Getting there, uh, timing is uh, crucial for the swimmer to understand the uh, where they're going to uh, attempt to uh, reach the rocks and uh, re-enter the surf. And if I'm not saying anything correctly, Perun, uh, correct me. Uh, packaging up the patient in the surf. These are from all different different years of uh, activity. Just getting in and out of the boat takes some doing. Uh, we're usually not in these, uh, what we call the Gumby suits anymore, uh, but uh, these were some of the first survival or exposure gear that we had to work with. And uh, the ones with the belts and the, the Harness points uh, were the rescue suits. They had uh, boots on them, so it's a big deal. It's also a big deal to find out which one has the uh, leak in it. And, uh, yeah. Uh, swift water training in the uh, Saco. This is uh, throwing the rope bag. So uh, we, we carry with us a lot of these uh, bags of rope. They're about 75 feet uh, long. Uh, you give them a good toss to try to reach your victim, either in front or it's moving really fast behind them and it will, will come to them. Uh, and 
At the same time, the people in the water, who are our folks, are uh, learning uh, how to steer themselves. They're learning, is the current faster over here than it is in the center or vice versa? Uh, the hydraulics around things in the water. Uh, they're taught, don't put your foot down anywhere. Good way to uh, snap an ankle or a, a leg. And uh, one of our other more complex activities is uh, using a small boat on a pulley system. And we control it as a, it's actually like a mountaineering thing that there's a guy's name that goes with this that uh, I couldn't, uh, that brain cell died somewhere. Uh, but uh, we, we can control the boat left to right in the water or up and down. So if somebody was a victim that was hanging on to a tree or a rock or something in the river, couldn't get, get away, uh, we could uh, get that boat down. It takes a little while to set up. We usually use the, the gun to fire a line for us, but uh, interesting. More up to date, more recent uh, swift water drill. Our gear, no longer Gumby. It's a little more sophisticated and uh, protective. There's a small boat operation involved. Uh, ice drills of the uh, past. Uh, so extracting people uh, from where they've gone in. Some more ice drill on the left. Just one big happy experience. <laughs> and Andy Strout. Uh, now, we are not a dive team at one time we had a kind of an inner organization of diving. Uh, it's very difficult to maintain that type of a team, uh, especially for a volunteer organization. And uh, we had to let that go. The town was concerned about liability in that area. And, uh, but we do, we will support uh, rescue diving or uh, such activities with the boat uh, what, uh, as, as needed. We've had some spectacular opportunities to train in different places. Uh, we were aboard the uh, Scotia Prince and uh, doing some rappelling, trying not to get footprints on the side of the boat. They did not appreciate that. Uh, but we did set up a zip line type system to uh, get people off from the boat, uh, which you see on the uh, top. And as the person leaving the boat goes down, the small boat comes in underneath and uh, picks them off if everything goes uh, right. Uh, it depends on station keeping of that boat to keep tension on the line and uh, I'll save that story for another day. Uh, and we do, we are involved in technical rope rescue and uh, Joe Mokri is leading the class there. We uh, sometimes use the fire department ladder as a, as a point in space, a change of direction point to uh, operate through. Uh, once or twice, the ladder truck was used like a crane. Uh, that's forbidden. And uh, we got that message pretty uh, quickly, I think, uh, and uh, regrouped. But, uh, so that very technique uh, in, that, in that picture on the left is, is a training exercise. But in March 99, we had a young man uh, on a tour bus fall uh, quite a distance and it was determined that that was the best way at the time to get them up. Uh, John Byer, who was a wet team member at the time, uh, uh, rode with the patient to stabilize the litter and uh, 
transform at the top. So again, it's like uh, you you train or you talk about it, and then bang, it happens uh, two months later. And uh, just some uh, repelling uh, without the ladder truck, basic uh, basic operation. And uh, the hardest part is uh, when you get to the top. You usually, don't flip the flip the litter over like that, but uh, it's it's what what takes takes some practice. Okay, calls uh, we've been on. Um, Amen. I can talk about this. Uh, uh, so we don't have anybody that was out in the boat to talk about this call. So we'll, we'll, we'll give you a brief. So AMAD was uh, Sean Rafter, uh, his company uh, Echo started in the mid eighties. He did commercial helicopter work. He launched AMAD SkyCare in uh, that year, 93. And uh, that was the first thing in the state that was dedicated to doing uh, air medical transports. What you know today as Life Flight of Maine, completely unrelated to this uh, company, which would, would start in 1998. Uh, in the AMED crash, um, he flew a crew from Portland up to Ellsworth, picked up a patient, and uh, was en route back to Portland uh, to get the patient to Maine Medical Center. Uh, conditions worsened. Um, it's, it's a long, long story detailed about uh, decisions that were made. Uh, he uh, got permission to fly higher in uh, what would what would be instrument uh, flight rule conditions and uh, basically got down very close to Portland, uh, ran out of fuel, and the uh, helicopter was brought down in auto rotation, but hitting the surf, it, it immediately uh, overturned. Uh, not the fault of any uh, equipment, uh, errors were attributed to the pilot. And in this case, uh, uh, he was a uh, Vietnam era pilot, a lot of training, a lot of operations under uh, stress. Uh, the other crew would have trained uh, with a uh, Boston med flight in a simulator so that they get in and you, you may have seen TV documentaries about this, where the simulator turns over into the water and they get out while divers are, are watching them for safety. So it's that that training. Different a difference between a, a pool of uh, standing water and uh, sixty knot winds and uh, high surf and almost pitch blackness and cold. So. Uh, the uh, the crew and the patient was lost, the pilot survived, but it was our most uh, demanding, uh, physically demanding rescue, uh, I think. Uh, the conditions were described as uh, sleeting, uh, the cold and the wind. Uh, uh, Joe Motri had initially taken one boat out, uh, Stevie Jordan, uh, had taken a boat out from uh, the Portland side, and they went to the last uh, reported uh, position, uh, searched around for uh, a number of hours. Uh, eventually, the uh, pilot was located. Uh, I think what what Andy was Andy and uh, Danny was saying when we were talking about this. Uh, the guy running the boat, uh, who I think was Andy at that time, was the one up in the boat. Everybody else was down in the boat like this, uh, getting into that stage of hypothermia. So it's 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 a it's a risk for us as rescuers. It's dangerous, and uh, 
that's why we're we're gear intensive, we're training intensive, and uh, we picked up the pilot, transferred the pilot to the uh, fire boat for uh, medical care uh, in a uh, nice heated environment. They uh, kind of threw that in. Uh, the uh, I think we are somewhere off an outcrop of Vale Island uh, is where it came down. So, you know, fate has it. Without that strong a headwind, he probably could have completed that flight. He wouldn't have burned that much fuel. But, uh, terrible loss uh, to the uh, uh, EMS community, emergency medical community. And uh, my other half, who just retired from the uh, ER at Maine Med, uh, used to fly with them. But she she liked to do the fixed wing flights, and a lot of those would go into Canada. So uh, she was uh, quite familiar with them. There were commendations earned by the team and the team members, and uh, commendations describe the conditions and so forth. Said almost 80 other search craft were involved for uh, mm -hmm. hours. Uh, you know, the, uh, that, that's Andy's uh, copy of the thing. Uh, we think about aviation. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff coming and going and overhead. Uh, participate in the drills. Uh, anybody recognize where that helicopter might have come from? Red and white. So that was the last uh, unit that we had at Brunswick Naval Air Station, the search and rescue component. Uh, so uh, that was one that we did uh, training with and uh, other agencies. Uh, we would have another plane come down in the water later on. Uh, this one after takeoff uh, and uh, uh, fuel problem, maybe medical emergency, and some combination of things. Uh, but the uh, pilot, uh, who was a physician out of Turner, uh, perished. Two thousand six. Uh, there's there's quite a long letter from uh, Kurt Brown who. Uh, was uh, out lobstering and uh, encapsulizes uh, uh, risk that we have. This is a guy that's uh, grown up on the water, uh, worked on the water, a lot of training. Uh, he's out there and uh, dressed for it. Uh, he uh, just that combination of swells comes up. Uh, covers the boat and like in 10 seconds, the boat is uh, taken on enough water, slipped and uh, he's in the water. So he's in the water with his oil skins and boots and he's not gonna float with those. So he's getting that stuff off. And then he commences the attempt to uh, swim to shore, but he's out quite a ways. So he's describing all, all of this and uh, just getting from one lobster buoy to another uh, and uh, uh, the fatigue and uh, eventually the uh, uh, wet team and fire department uh, were were notified and uh, arrived and uh, it was a save and he was grateful and uh, not only that he joined the became a member of the wet team so uh, uh, local people helping local. Uh, two missing kayakers. You uh, all that. So uh, we had uh, a pair of kayakers. Not everything turns out well. Uh, these were uh, young women leaving from Peaks to go to Ram Island Light. 
Um, the parents actually could see the, uh, the kayaks leave. One kayaker, a lot of experience, made this trip many times. The other kayaker, zero experience in, a, in an ocean kayak. Uh, they reach Ram Island. Uh, in the meantime, a uh, small craft advisory had been issued for the afternoon. The sea changed, the wind came up from the north. And uh, I'm sure as they tried to make their way back from Ram, Towards peak, they were going right into that wind. They were being blown down, and uh, uh, this search uh, culminated in finding the kayaks, and shortly afterwards finding them, uh, uh, finding the two victims uh, uh, deceased, uh, but uh, still wearing flotation. They were lightly dressed for the weather, but they did have. Uh, uh, life vests on. If I remember right, Jim, it was like a nice sunny 70 degree day in May, but the water temperature was still down in the low 50s. So. Right. <laughs> right. And uh, it's, it's used in, so this example came from a Center for Cold Water Safety, and they were describing a couple of incidents that talked about that exact thing. Uh, team uh, Commendation for our efforts. Uh, just a couple of these were proactive uh, about things. We uh, we have a lot of calls where something breaks loose and is floating, and you look at that and say, "Did somebody fall out of that? Were they boating? Did it did it break loose from a mooring? Uh, particularly paddle craft." Uh, so. Coast Guard District 1 actually invented this sticker. Uh, most of the time when you buy something new from a recreational dealer, uh, they give you that sticker as part of the uh, package. Uh, but we have lots of them. Uh, we, we're happy to give them away. Uh, they have some at the police station too. Uh, you can pick them up anytime. Uh, so just that ability to call up and say, uh, were you, was somebody using your kayak or uh, was it tied up somewhere? We can resolve that. Or we can spend $80,000 of tax money to get a helicopter and a Coast Guard boat out uh, conducting a search. So uh, these things are very effective. Having a float plan is like having a flight plan. It's to say, uh, I'm going from here at this time. I'm going to go thereabouts. I expect to be back at this time. I need my medications that are such and such. And uh, I've got my phone, phone number. I can leave that on my vehicle. I can leave that with, with somebody I live with or leave it on the refrigerator. But uh, it lets us know uh, some of these overdue uh, situations. Uh, we've conducted, uh, I think, three uh, paddleboard safety seminars. Two were highly successful. One was a flop. Uh, uh, we we got into Easter and Easter won. So uh, we had as many presenters as we had people in the audience, but uh, that happens. Uh, this was one of the first ones, and we again the team getting a commendation there. Uh, we did uh, had people uh, giving static uh, demonstrations of things, vendors. We were at the Richards Pool. Uh, we brought in people to do demonstrations of uh, kayak uh, uh, recovery and uh, survival, different different types of roles and things. We had a uh, one, one lady was a champion in, in these competitions. She could roll the kayak and recover upright just using her upper body uh, without a panel. So I can't do that. <laughs> uh, use of the pad, use of the oars, uh, use of the paddles. Uh, Bridging with an, uh, uh, somebody out of a kayak, bringing your kayak in to help them uh, 
rest and recover and get back in. Uh, people know about the wet dip on uh, New Year's Day. Uh, been going for how many years? I'd say at least 25 years. 25 years. So, uh, you know, we, uh, we help with it. We have our swimmers in the water just in case somebody gets in and uh, really gets a shock from the cold water. Uh, we maintain uh, a lot of throw lines at the ponds. We've uh, updated them. This is the new, new and updated version of the throw line. It used to be a buoy on a rope. Uh, and uh, it will tell you where you are. Uh, if, uh, if you're unfamiliar with the area, if you were on a walking path, and you could throw that to somebody without going on the ice or going into the water. And we recommend ice picks for people who are going to be on the ice uh, that uh, if you're in a broken through the ice and you can get your feet up behind you, you can use these ice picks and just gradually pull yourself uh, along. That's my best mime. Uh, thing. Public relations, we do it when we can. Uh, opportunities to to demonstrate and get a reporter to go in the uh, water too. <laughs> okay. Recent calls. We're close to wrapping up here. Uh, so, uh, what we we know that this that water was starting to come over Sawyer Road in the marsh as it does, but with these uh, uh, very high tides and uh, coastal flooding uh, from uh, the weather. Uh, we get more water up in there than we normally do. Uh, he had stopped to uh, take pictures and uh, Chief, you want to talk about the response to this? Yeah, this, use the mic, Chief. You can't hear me, Sam. <laughs> Yeah, this particular gentleman here was coming from the uh, Cape Elizabeth Inn into Scarborough, and he was following another vehicle that went, well, he stopped first and questioned his thinking about going in, uh, driving across, but he saw the vehicle in front of him go and made it all right. But his only mistake was he stopped to take his picture, and once his tires floated up, he was all done and, and headed up uh, down the stream, so to speak. But anyways, we got the call and the wet team launched from, from what but where we're standing here, took the boat out and and uh, got to the gentleman in the car. And the first thing he did was hand his camera to the crew before they got him out. So, <laughs> but he was he was in a, a bad spot. I mean, he was right on the edge of the deepest part of the uh, river, so to speak. If he had gone in and gone under and submerged, he, we would never have got him. Like Jim says, we don't have a dive team, and the time factor of getting somebody there to, to retrieve him, it, he really lucked out that he got hung up there. The guys were able to launch and, and make the grab. So that one ended well. <clears throat> so you, a quick question. When you say you get the call, what was the uh, process for getting the call? Did, it, did he call directly? Yes, he was. He remained on his cell phone with the uh, Portland dispatcher the whole time and gave us uh, blow by blow reports of the water filling up the car and it was at his steering wheel. And yeah, we kind of talked him through it that we were coming to get him. And yeah, all in all, I mean, Again, he was in a bad spot. This was a fairly easy rescue for the team to make with an inflatable, but it was just a time factor of getting the boat launched and going to get him. But yeah, he was so glad to see the guys show up. Yeah, did he have his windows down or what? How, no. What sort of situation yeah. was he supposed to do? That's a good question because his his power door failed because the battery was underwater and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, we carry things we can puncture the glass, but I think. It had broken. It had broken. It had broken by the time we got there. Yeah, so they were able to unbuckle them and slide them out. But yeah, the best thing to do is if you get in this situation, I think you have a chance. Yeah, roll your windows down, unlock your doors, whatever you can do to, to help you. The rescue was out. You know what I mean. But we do carry uh, window punches and stuff to break it out. But that could have been a real factor if we, you know, they took <clears throat> some hand tools with them, anticipating it could be tough to get the door open. But again, that the time factor there is. Mm -hmm. A lot easier to have the glass broken out. 
How long does it typically take you to mobilize and, and get to someone? That one there, we were probably on scene. By the time we get the call, uh, the on duty crew was coming to the fire truck and the ambulance. I mean, Sam responded to that call. We were probably on scene seven or eight minutes, and then probably five minutes to launch a boat, get them. So, yeah, so it, was a, it was a fairly quick, quick rescue there. So, it was fairly time sensitive, too, when the, when the wet team members got the gentleman out of the water, just from the shore, that was the perspective we had here. We can see the car fall another at least foot, foot and a half into the march. Yeah, by the end, end of the day when the tide subsided enough, that car ended up about here somewhere. So it went out into the channel and came back around. So to give you an idea too, the tow company had to wait at least, I would say, thirty six hours before they could tow the car out of the marsh for mm -hmm. the water to be low enough. But no, he was lucky. <clears throat> Any other questions on that one? The charge. No. <laughs> no, that's a good idea, though. <laughs> we we do through taxes, and that's just the way to put it. Um, so for us, this is unique uh, for people in other parts of the country that are near rivers or in the southwest where you get rain and something that's very dry turns into a rushing uh, madhouse. Uh, they're more 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 acclimated to doing this type of rescue work. But uh, again, uh, we train, we train, we train, we make sure we know how to use our equipment and uh, uh, it pays off. Here we are. All right, we're up to the Tara Lynn. And we'll close out with the Terra Lynn. So uh, January uh, 13th, 1.30 in the a.m. And uh, report of a boat on to uh, Grundy Point. Um, anybody want to step up and talk about this one that was there? I'll say a little bit about it for a minute, and Jim. She, <clears throat> yep. Yeah, on this particular call we were a little late to the party the coast guard got the um mayday about 12 30. um the crew of the boat did not know that the wet team existed long story short the coast guard didn't make the call to us which reasons unknown the salvage um company heard the mayday on his radio he was working on his boat in portland harbor changing the oil so he finished that up and he headed right out he got on scene and noticed they didn't see any blue lights or red lights on the shore. So he kind of asked the captain of the uh, Tower Land if he had notified the, the wet team yet, and they didn't know what he was talking about. So he made the call. I think he called one of our members' cell phones first, and Nate explained him the process. They got to call 911 to get us activated. So eventually we showed up and kind of did a risk assessment of the scene and had conversations with the Coast Guard and determined the the best course of action was for us to launch our little inflatable boat. You guys saw a picture there and, and go out and get the crew. Um, the amazing thing about this rescue was once the decision to go was made, it was about two o'clock in the morning. These guys set the crew on shore by 2.20. Wow. Yeah, they went with four people on board. I was expecting to see, go out, get one. Um, Arun and Eric were on the boat. I figured they'd bring one crew member at a time. They brought back in two. And these weren't small guys either, but yeah, so they made two trips out and had the whole crew safely on shore in, in less than 20 minutes. So. We, we need to be certified as boat operators. And no, not necessarily to get on because generally, ideally, we're going out with a crew of three to four where we have an operator. Um, ideally four, we have two rescue swimmers, one that's going to go in and then one that's tending. But in uh, a small yeah. boat, you would be a crew of? Uh, depending on the conditions, yeah, two. So on that night, Nate was was at the helm or at the outboard and her room went in the first ride to take the first two off. Our initial thought was we actually, did you? we had the lead for that call, but we see pictures of M68. Yeah. Our larger boat. So you saw our larger rigid hull inflatable. We tried to launch that at South Portland 
um, but there are reports of other boats going over around the point and taking water over the bow. So we had originally tried to launch thinking that they would come in to support uh, with M68, our larger boat. Um, that wasn't able to access it. All the other uh, hard vessel boats, you can see the salvage boat on one side and another picture of the Coast Guard. They couldn't come from her starboard side because it was too close in and the Coast Guard won't come in normally below 50 feet of water draft. Um, so as Chief Young was saying, the decision was made to, to launch the 10-footer. Uh, and ideally, we thought we might be able to get three of us out, one on board the Terra Lynn to help assist with the crew in lowering them down to our inflatable. Um, but we could tell it was listing so high in the freeboard, which is essentially the term for the water, the, the, the height from the, the base of the water to the top was so high that we couldn't get on board. So uh, I think they're, yeah, <laughs> we, they realized we're going to be, <laughs> you'd be ready to jump. So uh, we did, or they did, um, jump, but lowered themselves down, and then we took, as Chief was saying, two at a time back, gentlemen. Is that pretty typical that they can go directly from their boat into your boat without going in the water? Or do you it would all be circumstantial, honestly. That just happened to to look out where uh, they had a they have a high uh, a gunnel, and then there's a break where they're able to outriggers go out where they're bringing the nets and the rigging back in. And so that lowered it. And I think Haroon, that was the first, at least what I did was while Nate was was keeping it steady alongside, I had to reach and grab. And Haroon, you did the same where you just grab that to try and stabilize it. Again, we have rolling six to eight foot waves. So you're doing this and all of a sudden your hands are down there and then your hands are up here. But they got, they were in their survival suits. I remember there was mentioned before that other incidences, they did not have survival suits in, in some of the vessels that we responded to. So they, after the first two, they were they were ready. <laughs> What's going on, ma'am? Right from the shoreline, right from uh, from Trundy. Yep. yep. There was a, there's a little beach access. Um, we carried it through, and I want to make note too that um, even though. We're humbled by all of the, the gratitude and, and the applause that we're receiving for this. You know, we could not do this without the help of the entire department. Uh, we're there. We're, we're later to the scene than usually the first responders are. Getting all our equipment. I turned around and uh, there were six different pairs of hands just ready from the other departments to take us there. They had the whole scene lit up. You can see all the backlighting there. Uh, so it's really a collective effort. Now, we happen to be perhaps in the limelight tonight, but... Honestly, other members of the department deserve as much praise in, in that rescue as, as the WEF team did. I just want to, I want to add two details. Um, one is the, they're being modest. The uh, Coast Guard basically refused to help and Portland Fire Department tried, but the surf was so hard that the WEF team's only option was to launch from the shore. So it really was an incredible rescue. The chief and I were watching from the shore and it was incredible to watch the team go out rescue two at a time, come back. We looked down at our watch and like the chief said, 40 minutes from the time that we got the call to everyone was safely back on shore. 20 minutes since when they decided to go back out is truly incredible. Um, the other detail that's interesting for this call is I spoke to the 911 dispatcher who took the call from the captain of the vessel. And um, they were a little confused at first. The call originally was dispatched as a rock rescue. They didn't realize that they were in so much water. They thought it, they thought basically it looked like in the news article here where they were completely grounded. So the 911 center in Portland dispatched the wet team as a rock rescue to, to walk out to the crew to rescue them. Obviously, when we got there, that was a little bit different, as you can see in the picture on the left there, which is why we took about 10, 15 minutes to decide that the, the best launching yeah, you course of action was. And to boat. see where this ended up the next day, this boat was actually way out here on the point. It got washed in with the tides. It's, that's not what we rescued right. them from at all. But they they deserve tons of praise. It was a very impressive uh, rescue to watch. I, I wanted to add that. And uh, I got ripped apart pretty good. Those rocks are unforgiving. Uh, there were accolades. The uh, Fisherman's Forum recognized uh, our folks uh, at their annual meeting. 
and uh, presented the plaque. We don't know who that guy in the middle is. He just sort of slipped in there. And uh, press release, uh, very good. And uh, this one is with uh, Parker Poole from the uh, uh, Determination Marine. So he, he had the uh, salvage boat that came around uh, first off. Uh, but uh, uh, we applaud our own and, uh, oops. That is the end. I th I think you can appreciate from from the Judy and Betsy, we've come full circle around to the Terrellin and uh, done a, been able to do what uh, they conceived we'd be able to do uh, the next time uh, something happened. So we do do fire prevention in the schools a lot. Um, it's a good idea to add water safety as well. I will say that. I went to Cape Elizabeth High School and we did kayak and water safety in gym class with PE with the PE teacher. Um, the picture that you saw in the, the pool where a kayak goes on top of each other to help. We, we've done that. Every high school does that in, in class as well. Um, and there's also a PE adventure class that that same kayak instructor teaches. They kayak out to Richmond Island and they learn a, a more advanced water safety, kayak safety, things like that. Um, we've also been... Um... Can you hear me all right? I'll use my outside voice. Yeah. Um, okay, back to the mic. Um, and we've also begun kind of incorporating what we call PSAR, or preventative search and rescue. And um, we'll sometimes assess the situation. Most commonly when we have these, these big storms come in, um, what happens when people will flood the two lights area and, and we're realizing we can never underestimate the propensity for the human condition to get themselves into trouble. <laughs> um, but we'll be there during that and just gently encourage them not to get too close or understand where they are on the tides. If the tide cycle is coming in and we see people moving closer and closer, we're realizing that what's going to happen, the water's going to be coming closer and closer. So some of that preventative search and rescue, we will we'll try and incorporate as well. Why don't they ever close the road to two lines? That is, um, I was, I was step up away there from that. through all of that January 13th storm, trying to keep my storm drain clear. And it was constant traffic. There were four of us trying to keep that storm drain open because the road was under about five inches of water. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, usually the police department is pretty good about barricading and shutting that down. But you know, it, it actually was close when people were driving around the car. That's, that's another that's problem. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they've got probably four or five different locations of this yeah. stuff going on at the same time. Right. So trying to keep up with it. And two lights is run by the state so that they would have a say in whether the park is closed as well. Yeah, but this was at the end. Okay. People are constantly coming down. Turn around, go back. So, uh, different questions. So, are there more wet teams now in communities throughout Maine? Or are you guys still the only game in town? I think these guys are pretty much the only game in town or one game. Well, this there is one at MDI, yeah. I believe. Uh, Mount Desert Island has a, a water contingent to it, but I'm not sure if it's still what they used to at one time. Yeah, some of the islands may have uh, better better uh, preparation. Uh, and of course, we've we've transitioned everywhere from volunteer organizations to more uh, uh, per diem paid uh, fire department. So a lot of the capability is in the fire station. Uh, sometimes with uh, like Old Orchard has lifeguards. They have a, a wave runner and boats. So uh, depends on where you go. Uh, Brunswick reached out to us early from some of the correspondents and said, you know, uh, we had a guy fall off the bridge into the river and drown and we're interested in putting something together. So mm -hmm. it, it, it varies where you go. So, so then do you respond to if another town, if Scarborough called you and needed help, did you guys go? We've we've had automatic response with Scarborough and uh, some, of, some of that is uh, it's kind of codified in the dispatch center who gets called for what types of things but uh, uh more than one more than one respond uh, boat 
is is better than one by itself because you have that safety effect of you have more eyes and uh, that's what we try to do. Additional context for this question, the South Portland Fire Department does have a seasonal boat. Uh, I think they store it at around bug light area, um, but that's staffed by a full-time engine company who cross staff is that, that rescue. Um, and the Portland Fire Department has a year-round full-time fire boat, and they have rescue swimmers full-time on their heavy rescue fire apparatus as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we respond mutual aid automatic on a lot of Portland Harbor boxes that require additional resources. Yes. I have lived here my whole life. And I want to tell you, this has been extremely informative. And I Thank think you. a lot of the Cape people don't take it for granted. But we do appreciate, but we, I had no idea. This has been absolutely above all, everything informative of how you work together and respect everybody's strengths and how much time and when you're called out of bed. I mean, <laughs> we are totally blessed. Thank you. Was it we're, we're, we're the best kept secret. Um, Sure. Uh, Ma'am, you had a question uh, before? Or? No? Okay. That I would want to follow that. So <laughs> I had a question. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you, ma'am. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, so, we've kept you a bit, but I think there's still coffee and uh, yeah. goodies back there. Yeah. And reading material, et cetera. Thank you all for attending. We're uh, we're thrilled to have uh, talked to you all. Thank you very much. Nice job, Jim. Actually, our jam really nice.